Hey guys, it's Roderick. I'm here with Astonishing Iceman number four. So, some program notes. Thank you so much for guys for the likes, for the subscribes. The channel is definitely upward trending and I really, really appreciate it. I will continue to, to deliver you great content as I see it. And it seems like y'all like the comic book review. So like, fantastic. So let's delve into this issue. So as I like, if you go back and I was talking about like Astonishing Iceman number one, I had such high hopes for this book, right? Bobby Drake, Iceman, the jokester, one of the original X-Men. And I was really, really openly gay. Like I was like, had such high hopes for this book. And it just kind of has fallen flat. Now, what I have realized, as you'll see in some of my other reviews for the comic books that came out in November, that's across the board. Like, I really feel like these follow-up X books were something but a total money grab where to kind of bridge between kind of like the Hellfire Gala and really into like the fall of the House of X, Rise of Powers of X. And they really, there was so much they could have really done with this book as far as Bobby Drake. But I feel like this was just a drawn out way for us to really get to the point where we see that Bobby Drake probably will not survive this fall of X. And because he's not in the promos and the way this issue sets up, it looks like Bobby is not going to make it. And I'm really pissed because, I mean, if you I, I don't like the way they did Warren, I'm not going to be happy if Bobby dies. And, you know, again, it was so much they really could have done. But I've enjoyed the book. It's lighthearted. I know they wanted to make it kind of lighthearted. But the fact is, is that seeing one of his best friends die, you know, we really don't see Bobby kind of navigate that. We kind of get this relationship with him and him and Romeo, which I'm not complaining about. But also the fact of like he made think that the whole proposition of this book just seems very unpragmatic and really kind of out of sync of what we know the character to be, right? So let's say, set up the facts. At the Hellfire Gala, Bobby is seemingly killed, right? We now know that he is brought back to life through Romeo, who's his empath, who kind of brings his essence. Bobby can only stay solid for limited amounts of time, okay? Now, riddle me this. Bobby is an original X-Men. Regardless of what he may have thought or his feelings towards Professor Charles Xavier, he still has that training. And in no iteration did Xavier throw them out there to go to try to save lives without making sure they were ready. So tell me why Bobby would go out into the world only being the last 45 seconds, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 6 minutes, as opposed to staying his hot ass in Antarctica until he can stay solid, training, putting up a fortress, doing things that he can do just staying in Antarctica, as opposed to like showing up like Glinda the Goodrich and then just disappearing after 5 or 6 or 7 minutes. It makes no sense. Yes, there are people who need him. Yes, there are lives in danger. But if your ass can fucking evaporate after seven minutes, how much good are you really doing, right? It makes, so that's the proposition of this entire book that Bobby is somehow unwilling to stay and make himself corporeal solid for a long enough time as opposed to going out and trying to help people. And it just really doesn't make sense because if he just stayed as hot ass in Antarctica, then none of these problems would happen because A, he wouldn't be on Orcus's radar and all of these problems that are occurring would not have happened. And that proposition just seems very illogical because regardless of what his personality traits are, he still is a classically trained X-Men, one of the original X-Men. And nobody, none of them, not Gene, not Scott, not Hank, not Warren, will go about things this way. Now, maybe you'll say, well, maybe that's kind of the way Bobby does things. But that at the end of the day, the larger goal is not going to, is not served by him going out in the world and him not be able to be real. That's my rant. Let's just get into the issue. So the issue starts off basically as we saw like these, uh, the, we're feeling up there like the Fatal Four, Vulture. I don't read Spider-Man, but we feel like these are, these like the Vulture's hench henchmen, right? And they're attacking in New York City and they're attacking Spider-Man, right? So Spider-Man's fighting them off with this mutate name, named Chantal. Her name sounds familiar. I feel like I've seen her somewhere before, but I was just kind of like, Hoppo, who this, right? Like, who is she? But whatever. But, you know, it's Spider-Man. It's, you know, I, I really enjoy Spider-Man. I don't read the books, but you really can't write a bad Spider-Man because of his lighthearted nature and because of everything. So, I, you know, anytime that this Spider-Man shows up, I was like, okay, cool. This is great, right? So, for all, so we have Feral and Fatal. They're fighting them. And then all of a sudden, 
Fatal cuts off his head and they're like, ha ha, he got him. And he's like, no, really, it's not. So, you know, she, he throws his head at them. But then, so then Bobby leads Fatal and Farrell away while Spider-Man and Chantal deal with the other eight people. I don't know what Chantal's powers were. I don't know if she had any powers. She really wasn't using them that much. I was just like, why is she here and whatever, right? So as Iceman leads uh, Fatal and Farrell away, we get again another great use of Iceman's powers. He literally encases them in a glacier. Now, right before this happens, one of the other henchmen is like, you know, teleported away. They teleport, you know, the other two, they're in our Iceman's glaciers away. And we, re and so Spider-Man realizes and talking to Sean, talking to one of the Fatal Four, we'll call them Furies. That's no, I know that's definitely a DC reference, but it definitely gave me like the Apocalypse Fury type of vibe, right? So they're like, you know, the, the goal wasn't, the, the target wasn't Chantal. The target really was Iceman. So Spider-Man goes, sees Iceman and whisks them away. And then we get this very meaty, very kind of really great conversation between Iceman and Spider-Man. And Spider-Man's like, you know what? I was really worried that, you know, maybe I was a mutant. And, you know, and I don't know why I was so worried. But also I see like all the shit you guys have to go through being mutants. And I really didn't want to be a part of that. But I want you to know, Bobby, you have friends. And, you know, we see Bobby really kind of processing that his entire family is gone. You know, Scott's locked up. We don't know where Scott is. He don't know where, you know, Gene's dead. You know, half the X-Men got murdered. Like, the thing is all this. And we finally get to see Bobby kind of talk this out with someone who's really close to. Because I believe Bobby was a was, was Spider, was Peter Parker's roommate at one point, right? So I think they were roommates at one point. Because some, you know, Bobby kind of gets tired of the X-Men sometimes. And he'll just be like... Boo you all, I'm gonna go to New York City and hang out. And I think sometimes him and Peter Parker were roommates, especially when he was like in the closet at the time. Like he'd be bringing dudes over and banging them out in Peter Parker's apartment. Cause I think I remember an issue of Peter, Peter was like, don't be bringing random dudes up in my apartment, busting them out and then like sending them home, okay? Like I have this whole secret identity thing going on. And even if I didn't, I just don't want with your random hoes and tricks just running through my apartment, fucking up my Spider-Man costume with all the little shenanigans you have, right? Anyway. But you see them having a conversation and like they have bagels or whatever, right? So anyway, we also see kind of like in the data bulletin points that kind of the propaganda that Orcus is really putting up, right? So the way they kind of, the narrative they sense is that, you know, Spider-Man is this potential villain, which of course is nothing new, but also that the mutant Iceman's out there and then thankfully, lucky to Orcus, you know, they saved the day and stopped him from polluting the water and all this stuff. And we really see that Orcus has not only just attack the mutants, kill the mutants, but they have a propaganda campaign that's going on. We even see a chick that's in the comic book that when Iceman shows up, she's calling to report seeing Iceman. So a lot of people have bought into this anti-mutant propaganda, which of course isn't really hard because the anti-mutant sentiment has been present since the inception of the X-Men, right? Like that's the kind of the whole thing is that Orcus isn't anything new, is just, you know, kind of like the mutant version of MAGA. Right. So anyway, the vulture shows up and sees director P quad and the vulture's like you out here borrowing my people and you can't even get the work done. You didn't even kill Spider-Man and you definitely didn't kill Iceman. What's the whole point of borrowing my people, wasting my valuable resources? And P quads like, you know what? Mind your business, because you know what? The point wasn't to kill Iceman. The point was to wear him down, make him present because we got a bigger plan. Now you're excused. Go back to your vulturey business. Right. So then we get to see Iceman comes back home and now the fortress is melting. The picture's falling off the walls. He's like, what's going on? He walks into the war room. Romeo's on the floor bleeding and the cleaner is sitting there sitting in the throne room. So we're going to see another fight, right, between Iceman and the cleaner. And then the cover kind of depicts a broken piece of Bobby's head, which means that Bobby probably won't survive this. Or if Romeo's dead, he probably won't survive and that's going to be very sad, right? Like, that's going to really touch my heart in a way because, again, I like Bobby Drake. I like the Iceman. I like the fact that he was he was elevated to an Omega-level mutant, right? And I just, I don't know. I We'll have to see how this, how, how this kind of plays out next month um, as all these Fall of X books kind of wrap up. But, you know, I, I, I feel like he could deserve the better going out as somebody than the hands of the cleaner because this is really all of Bobby's making anyway, right? Like these are, these, this whole situation is 1000% his fault 
and I need I need this story to wrap up in a clean way. So anyway, that is Astonishing Ice Man number four. Drop down in the comments. Let me know. Like I recognize that sometimes my takes may be a little off kilter. So if you're liking the book, tell me what you like. Let's have some discussion and some thoughts about it. And I will see you guys later. Bye.